your ear pin drop, and that's what I like. And from there. And I saw a glint in the far distance, and it was an antenna. Friends at home, so you know what we're talking about. I was in charge of the snipers on the ground and I made a command decision to move. Craig, good to finally meet you, brother. No worries. You looking well? Thank you. And you, you're looking well as well, mate. Well, I'll do my best. I've had days feeling better. I told you, didn't I? I put my back, well, put my back out as an understatement. I've shown you my MRI and it's not, it's not looking too good no, down there, no. but um, every day in paradise, so I don't really care. So thank you for your book, mate. Um, it's, it's a bloody big old thing to write. In fact, before I do that, Craig, I'm going to say a few keywords because apparently if I say keywords at the beginning of a podcast, YouTube recognize them through their like hearing software. And um, if it matches the title of your podcast, here you go, folks, lesson for you in YouTube, then, then they put it out to more people. So um, Sergeant Craig Harrison, former Blues and Royals, um, Craig's going to come on and tell us more about this, but, but I think the first sniper in, uh, in their history um, seen a bit of the old combat, can we say? Yeah. And uh, been on the all ends of it. Um, but also something that we have in common, other than the military side of things, is we're, we're both authors. <laughs> so, um, yeah, congrats on your book, mate. Thank you. Thank you very much. My, my guy Luke's going to be, like, flashing it up on the screen, but... Uh, just a quick look for friends at home so you know what we're talking about. And uh, that's funny, isn't it, Craig? When you mention, like, who's got the longest sniper, everyone comes out of the woodwork and starts, no, 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 my mate in the Paris, he does it. <laughs> does it really matter? No. <laughs> but boys get, like, really, you know, men get really, like, childish about that sort, sort of stuff. But... Um, yeah, how's the book? How's the book doing? You, you were saying it's doing quite well. Yeah, it's doing all right. Yeah, it's still selling. You know, it's been out a while now, and um, still going quite strong. You know, doing these podcasts and speaking and all that. More people know about it. More people want to know about me. So, uh, you know, I wrote the book just because um, about the sniper shot, really. And um, but I just couldn't write one chapter, so I had to fill it in with my life story basically and uh, people find that more interesting than the actual shot sometimes so yeah it's all good it's for, it's it's interesting reading military books because we've all had such in we've got so much in similar people that join the forces I mean, you talked about your brother a lot didn't, didn't you in the book and have you got a brother yeah, Mark, yeah. And did he join up before you? Or, or? Yeah, he joined, he joined the Royal Artillery, uh, King's Troop. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, sorry, Craig, I've got a memory like a bloody sieve. <laughs> I can listen to an audio book, get to the end of it, and I have to listen to it again because if I'm, say, I'm all right in the car, it all goes in really well, but if I'm, say, in my workshop making something, I, I think my concentration goes on the thing that I'm doing and then I'm yeah, like sure. yeah, I think I do, yeah yeah I do, I do that as well so yeah you're not the only one yeah but it's interesting isn't it if you you read people's um joining up stories and there's a there's normally some similarities the old trip down a recruitment office oh yeah 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 getting At getting your money getting for starting to send allegiance to the queen yes and then you get you get your couple of what, 15 quid i think i got yeah yeah and you sell your allegiance to the queen who you swear it and uh all, and all her heirs and successors yes yeah. so if bobo the clown is the next one in the that's it fellas 
<laughs> You'll all be driving around in them little car, little coloured cars that go boof. <laughs> Wheels come off. <laughs> yes. Yes, writing. Um, uh, it's just the one book you've got. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I've got another book as well, but um, it's about... I write everything in a book and um, like if I'm feeling depressed or or anxiety or something like that, I write all my, my dark thoughts down in this book and um, it's got a lock on it. My wife bought it me. It's a leather bounded book and um, it's nearly full. And I'll, and what I, what I'd love to do is publish some of this book to tell people this is mental health. You know, it's not sitting there, you know, talking about it. I'm actually living it. And this is in black and white. And this is what one person's hell goes through every day, you know. And it just tells you about uh, how the military let you down, how the government lets you down and stuff like that. But no one's willing to publish it because it's too too um, to the bone, you know, which is a shame because people need to know. You, you know, I'm not the only one out there with mental health issues. There's other people out there that just get totally ignored. Yeah. Well, I can help you with that, mate, because all my books go out through an awesome company. There we go. You can see it on the spine there, folks. Look, Surf Books. And I happen to know the director of Surf Books. And he's incredibly handsome, uh, ex Royal Marine. Massive, massive, massive hit with the chicks. Like you wouldn't believe. Well, he's settled down a bit now, and uh, he's got a po- does a lot of podcasting and stuff. But no, I'd highly recommend to anyone start your own publishing company because my publishing experience, let's just say, Craig, it didn't come without a few. Yeah. When you get to the point in your publishing experience where you're actually wondering if you can hire an assassin to take your publisher out, then you. <laughs> But um, no, seriously, I'll chat. I can chat with you about that later, mate. Because I made a decision. Now I'm not letting other people have their mitts on my work again. They, 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 they just literally don't. To them, it's they don't care about you as an all. Well, I, I can't speak for every publisher, and I've had three now. So I've got six books. I've had three publishers, four including Surf Books, which, as you probably gathered, is my company. And I just made a decision that every penny I see coming in my bank, I've earned that, right? Yeah. You know, I, it might not be on the international scene, but I've done that probably. Uh, you, I guess your book was in the best-selling charts, was it? Yeah, it was, yeah. One of the top 10. Yeah, yeah. I got. I walked through Heathrow Airport and my, number, my book was number two bestseller. It's a good feeling. Yeah. Well... Because you're, you know, you've been through the trauma, and so have I, mate. And 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 as you probably experienced, lots of people doubt you, don't they? And yeah, and um, I people say, "Well, oh, ping us your manuscript, Chris. I'll tell you if it's all right." <laughs> I thought I'm not going to write a book if it's shit. I'm only going to write a good one. And to walk through Heathrow and see it, I think I was uh, one below Gary Neville, one above James Corden. Um, and I'd done that, you know, I'd recovered from chronic addiction and mental health to, 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 do, mm. to do that. It was nice. But to the same end, when people start like, you know, one of my books, the publisher edited it and their proofreader chose every time I said got, they chose it to gotten. And I just said to them, what? That's American. I'm English. What? And, it, and the, the proofreader wasn't, they weren't even American. They were English. So, <laughs> and publisher, they don't get that this you, that's your baby. You've worked thousands of hours on that book, or certainly hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And so, yeah. So we'll um, we'll talk about that, and we'll we'll get you on the road to getting your mental health book published yeah. because that's where the value is. You know, war books are interesting to read, but there's a bigger battle going on, isn't there? And then it's, it's in all our minds. Oh yeah, of course. I want my wife to do a chapter as well. Do you know what I mean? Just to have the point of view of what a wife goes through with a soldier with PTSD and mental health. Mm. So, have you got uh, some crayons? Got crayons. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Um, so I'll tell you what, for our friends at home, and um, let's just go through your story linear style or, or diary style, because I think they're, they're, they're um, probably quite keen that we don't keep going off at tangents about things like books. But yeah. Um, so you rocked up at the um, recruiting office. What, what, how is it you ended in Blues and Royals? Because I'll think in linear terms of kind of like Marines, Paris, Paris, RAF, Navy. It's, it's quite a seemingly obscure choice. Unless, of course, you you, you know you. Got- yeah, I wanted to. I've been, I've been riding horses since I was little, so I loved horses. You know, I used to compete in show jumping, do uh, Prince Philip games like Jim Carn and stuff. I've been to the Horse of the Year show when I was younger, and I thought my granddad always said to me, "You need to get a trade." You know, think of a trade like, and I thought, "What do you mean, gas engineer, electric?" And he goes, "No, think think of the army," because he was in the RAF. And I thought to myself, well, how about I've, I've become a farrier, you know? And then and that's why I joined the Household Cavalry to become a farrier because there was no um, farriers around my local area that were taking on apprenticeships. So I, I went to the recruiting office and I said, I want to join the Household Cavalry and I want to, you know, I want to go mounted to with the horses. I want to become a farrier, you know? I did the tests and then I managed to get the Household Cavalry on the test tipped up at Purbright, and then it all started from there, you know. Well, I remember being lying against the wall and he said, Blues and Rolls are lifeguards. Blues and Rolls are lifeguards. And I thought, Blues and Rolls, yep, next. Blues and Rolls are lifeguard. Lifeguard, you didn't get a choice. You know, you didn't get told you your Blue and Roll. I just said it. I could have been a lifeguard, or I know, you know. But um, that's how it all stemmed from, for me to become a farrier, really. It can be a bit like that, can't it? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. On our first day in, in in induction, they used to call it. They shoved a paper in front of us and said, right, sign for your term. I didn't know what I wanted to serve. It was, there was a, a 12-year career engagement, I think it was. You got paid more money if you went for that. But then there was a like a 36-month short-term engagement, but you could leave after 18 months. So I looked at the bloke next to me and well, what are you going for? I'll go for the short ones. So I can get out if I don't like it. Yeah, let's go for that. <laughs> <laughs> but some blokes really knew what they wanted. They were straight yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, career-minded. Mm. And um, d- did you get to become a farrier then? No, I think um, the forge was full of handed bar tashed, big, big beefy cakes, old school Victorian clay pipe smoking farriers, you know, and... I was a bit dyslexic. So when they set us homework, I did more illustration than did writing. And then they didn't like it. So when I went to do my um, like an apprenticeship, they um, they said I couldn't go down to Metal Mowbray to become a farrier because my face didn't fit. So I didn't become a farrier. You know, which was quite heartbreaking. So what did you do? Um, I stayed with the on the mounted side for about another, I don't know, another two years. And then I went to the armoured side in Windsor and that's where I flourished. We call it the green side. You've got the ceremonial, you've got the green side. So um, I, I, I never looked back from there. I never went back to Knightsbridge again. Mm-hmm. So I just flourished. And then I think I started off as a driver and a CVRT, scimitar. And then I started as a, then went to an operator to be a gunner and then a commander, and then I went off and did my sniper's course. Wow. Craig, I've got a couple of questions that I'm probably never going to get to ask anybody else on the planet in my lifetime. Yeah. So um, when you said the mounted side, did you actually get to ride? Yeah, yeah. I did Troop in the Colour, State Openings, you know, Captain's Escorts, did Queen's Lifeguard down in Whitehall and things like that, you know. It's quite hard going. We had the highest able weight in the British Army at so one point because you think you're a 16-year-old lad and you want to join the Army and you want to join the Household Cavalry. And because our riding school was in Windsor, they said, right, you go to Windsor. And they're going, oh, thank God, I'm not going mounted. And they end up going to the riding school instead. So it was like a double-edged sword. 
But um, yeah, it's, yeah, I quite enjoyed it. I quite enjoyed the horses, but I thought I was growing out of it at the time, so I needed to move on. I've just written another thing down I'm going to get to ask you. So I'm just wondering, mate, if I was to say the name Sefton to you, yeah, yeah, whether that means anything. Yeah, he was the horse that survived the ROA bombing outside mm. uh, our camp. Mm. And um, he was the one that made it back to camp and um, he became quite famous, really. And there was a big portrait in our um, Sergeant's Mess of Sefton next to a trough. Yeah. Yeah. So for our younger friends listening, the IRA let off a, a nail bomb. Yeah. Was it in one of the parks, Craig, wasn't it? It was High Park, yeah. It was just literally 400 metres up from camp. A car bomb went off, um, killed nearly all the horses bar Sefton, um, killed some of the troopers. And um, I do believe um, the, um, the police have a museum called the Black Museum. And um, it's invitation only, but they got one of our state helmets in there with nails in it. You know, and um, yeah, it was quite horrific. And there's a, um, a memorial there now. So if anyone goes to Hyde Park, go on the um, the London side where the st- streets are, and you'll see a memorial there. And we always lower our flag, and we always salute it as we go past. Mm. You know, just with respect to the fallen comrades. You know, crazy. I'm just thinking about all my generation. That was our childhood. Bloody IRA bombs going off everywhere. Yeah. I'll, I'll say yeah. IRA, but I don't believe any of it now. Could have been anyone letting those yeah. bloody bombs off. But Yeah, these days. Um, but friends at home, in case you're wondering what a nail bomb is, I know it sounds pretty self-explanatory, but it, it literally is that. It's, it's where you get your plastic explosive or, or well, not plastic explosive, but you pack it with, with nails and nuts and bolts and any shard metal you can get to act as shrapnel. And you can imagine the, the, the evil thing. I mean, bombs are bad enough at the best of times, but when you put those stuff in them, it's, it takes it to another level. Um, they say there's trees there with nails still in it, you know? So it's quite, quite an eerie sight if you go down there. Yeah. On the other side of the fence, mate, I went to the... Um, that petrol station in Gibraltar where the SAS shot the Gibraltar three. Okay. And um, back when I went, which was back in the very early nineties, there was still a hole, bullet hole in one of the pet- petrol pumps. And when you're doing that kind of work, Craig, is there any of say the queen security that are asked to blend in with you guys, maybe put a uniform on or something. No, no, we never had none of that. I don't know. But I remember that um, every time we had a state like escort coming up, the uh, Hereford lads used to come down, the SAS used to come down in their grey vans and grey Range Rovers and practice on the tubes, anti-terrorist stuff and all that. But that's the amount of protection the queen had on her, you know, but no one sort of mingled in with us at all, you know. Mm. unless they could ride horses but and carry swords and but yeah it's, it's, i saw a photo in some uh picture book one time and it was or it was a magazine or something and it was you know when the guys dress up like they're still in the 16th century or something with all yeah, the, yeah. The, the wigs and all of that sort yeah. of stuff and there was an arrow pointing at one of them who sat behind the queen in the carriage and it and it said this is actually you know detective sergeant so and so of the Met Police or something, <laughs> something like that. Oh right. And yeah, um, they might have they might have it because she has her own protection. She has a royal muse that's actually in Buckingham Palace, so she might have close protection that close to her. You know, because there has been people that run out onto the mall and try and touch her and things like that, do crazy things. But you know. Yeah, another thing when we were young, someone ran out and fired, I think it was like three rounds from a blank gun. Yeah, I remember that. Mm. And it shocked, it, it even shocked the security for a few seconds. No one did it, did, well, for a split second, no one did anything. <laughs> they all jumped on him. Yeah. And we we should acknowledge here, mate, shouldn't we, the, the terribly tra- tragic role horses have played in war. Mm. Um all those ones taken over to France, um, guessing 
First World War and Second World War, but the, the, the war horse story, hundreds were just like either left behind or, or executed because they, they couldn't be brought, brought back. No, they got like a memorial there by um, Marble Arch and it's a horse's head. Like, and uh, that's symbolize, you know, horses at war, uh, animals full stop, really, mm. you know, with dogs and stuff like that. Yeah, awful. Because our, our, our regiment now, they still do it. If you look on the hooves of the horses, they're branded on there with a number. So you'll have, for instance, the one I used to ride all the time was Kelso. His number was 17, and they have RHGD for the Blues and Royals. On his print printed on his hooves, and the reason why they've done that is because went over to France. Lads used to sell the horses for money to get food, and then go back to the quartermaster and go, "Look, I've lost my horse; it's died," you know, and get issued another horse. But they had to bring the hoof back with the number on it and say, "Look, my horse is definitely dead. There's its hoof. There's its number." And then that's how they can prove that the horse has actually died. <laughs> Come back to the quartermaster munching on a burger. Yeah, me horse run away. <laughs> <laughs> Got a new a new suit on and <laughs> yes. So there you are. Had had you had had experience in conflict before you put in your chit to become a sniper? Um, yeah, I went to I did Bosnia and uh, did Kosovo as well. And uh, then um, from there, when I came back from Kosovo. I started training to be a sniper and then I did Iraq tours and then Afghanistan as well. Mm. Mate, am I crediting you here with being much younger than me when you're not, actually not? I'm I'm 52 now. I'm 47. Oh, there we go. There we go, yeah. <laughs> Mate, you got a boyish face. Don't, <laughs> don't knock it. <laughs> I've got the lines of, I would say, too many late nights, but many of them weren't. The sort of night she slept on anyway. Yeah. Um. So yeah, great stuff. And I what what I can remember from the book is when you put your chit in to become a sniper, it surprised everybody. Yeah, it did um, because our regiment's not affiliated with snipers, um, but they had the um, a high guy in the RLC regiments, you know, with the armoured side. And they decided that snipers would work well in an armoured reconnaissance role. So they gave us the permission that we could actually have snipers at the regiment. So straight away, I put mine in. I wanted to be one, you know, and uh, I uh, excelled from there, really. Mm. Did you go to Limston to, to learn that? No, well, I went to the Purbright one uh, and, well, then, yeah. and, and then Warminster as well. Because I did my section commanders, platoon commanders in Barry Budden in Scotland, and then which was a fucking freezing, and then uh, I did advanced sniper shooting as well. So, and um, I think one thing that I remember from the book is quite powerful is the the physics involved in in firing off this round, this um, infamous sniper shot. The, the physics and the mechanics and the engineering of the rifle and all this kind of stuff. Was it interesting learning that stuff? Was, is, is it hard? It's not too hard because you have a calculator. So it's not like you, you sit there and go, yeah, yes, time's that. I've got to divide that by that. You know, just get a little calculator watch or a little diddy calculator and just work it out. It's your... The number two, because you work in a pair, so your number one would be the better shot, and then your number two would be the better sniper working out all the windage, elevation, barometric pressure, altitude, and stuff like that. And he would just transform that onto your scope, and then you take the shot, you know. That's how it works. And what what was your class made up of? Were it what, all different regiments and stuff? Yeah, in my class, we had uh, two Pathfinders, uh, we had some a um, lot, a lot of powers and some uh, costume guards as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I was the only household cavalry there. 
which they seemed shocked because I didn't even have a rifle. I had no gear or anything. I didn't have a pre-course uh, to build up. I just went there totally, totally fucking blind. And everyone else had like four weeks, nine weeks pre-course. And especially the powers were going through it as well. And I just tipped up with nothing. So the first weekend I had off, I spent the majority in the tailor shop making a ghillie suit, making my sticks, making my beanie, you know. We should point out here, shouldn't we, that the Marines do their own, they, they do their own course. Yeah, it's one of the best in the world, the, the Marine one. Yeah, it's highly recommended to. And if I did, somebody asked me the other day, if I did my army career again, what would I do? And I said, I'll probably join the Marines. Yeah, if I did it all again. Just because you, your ethos is better, you know, your aftercare, in the way you get treated. You know, so, yeah, all good. Yeah. Like I was saying earlier, it tends to attract a more sort of handsomeish soldier, I, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very, very, very good you say, mate. Yeah, the uh, Robin Horsfall SAS from who took part in the Iranian embassy siege. He he did his sniper training at Limston, and um, everything in the in the Marines in that sort of training field it, it's they always pride themselves not just getting it the best craig but getting it the most functional the most practical the leader yeah. would be a way that you hold your rifle when you're not firing it in case it, or, or something like this yeah um so uh yeah interesting as well that of course the marines are part of the navy and um i guess Purbright is run by the army yeah, yeah, and then though you've got obviously Warminster as well. So, and I, I remember coming back from my last Afghan tour, I um, I went down to uh, to teach down in Perbright for two years. So, ended up doing my course there and ended up being an instructor. So, yeah, mm. both worlds. So, out of how many people rock up for these courses and how many pass them? Uh, you're talking, you can have about 30 tip up on the course. And then you, you go through different fitness phases and then you, they weed you out. And so you end up with just either 10 on the course or 12 on the course. They, they hit you hard, you know, because as a sniper, you've got to be a one soldier. You know, your field craft's got to be there as well as your discipline, as well as being mature, as well as your shooting. Everything's got to be there. You've got to be the whole package, really. It's funny, my chief instructor was a Marine. Down there, yeah. And what, um, Craig, what uh, what did you picture in your mind when you wanted to become a sniper? What were you picturing the job was? Because to give you an See, idea. The first, prim the first primary role of a sniper, everyone's got this sort of like idea you need to go out with a rifle, we look for a scope and shoot people. It's nice to gather lifetime information of the battlefield. So you go out there and you're just getting intel all the time. You're gathering intel, 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 you know, and you give that information back to um, your HQ or your, your uh, platoon commander. And then the, uh, the decision gets made whether to take that target out or not, you know. And I knew at some point in my army career, I would have had to kill someone, mm -hmm. You know, and it's always at the back of your mind, but you never know when it's going to happen. Because obviously going on tour, some tours are quite just peacekeeping and some tours are quite, quite kinetic. And, you know, in, you, you, you're full on all the time. You're getting ticks all the time, you know, troops in contact all the time. So it all depends on where you are, you know, how you get treated. And I find being a sniper as well, you get treated more maturely. Um, you get better options of doing better ops as well, especially helping Hereford as well before uh, the FSG came along. You know, me and my mate, my number two, um, Eddie, we used to work all the time with Hereford, especially in the early Afghan days for FSG. You know, one power was um, sort of like affiliated with them. Do you get any SAS guys that are really biff shots? Yeah. Yeah. Don't say uh, don't don't say nearly all of them. No, no, and unfit. You know, surprising. I've done some uh, 
you know, like going down to Junior Brecon and things like that. And because they're in Hereford, they haven't got their their timetables are like massive and they haven't got time for fizz. So when you end up doing an entry test like a CFT or BFT or something like that, they end up failing it because they just can't, they haven't got the fitness because their timetable's packed. Gosh. I'd say for myself, Craig, when I think of the sniper role, I'm probably back in the day, I would have thought I'll be thinking like Carlos Hathcock, something. Yes. Yeah. You know, in particular, the, the crawling into position, the dedication to crawl for, de- you know, sometimes days on end, just, just to get that one shot. Yeah. The endurance, the, you know, the, the, bushes scraping at your skin the mosquitoes biting you the the loneliness of being out behind you know likely behind enemy lines on on in carl of half cox case i think he was on his own and uh, yeah a bit of a long wolf you know yeah. and he, he was a legend in his own right you know and um the way he, what he'd done in vietnam and things like that was just outstanding but i think through the generations, sniping has changed so much. You know, you can either be covert or overt to, you know, stamp your premises on the ground. But in his day and age, it was sneaky beaky stuff. You crawl in position and stuff like that, you know. But I think because of Afghan and Iraq, I think the green sniping was sort of left on a back burner for a while. And you're talking more urban roles and more desert roles than you do, you know, the green side. Craig, let's just quickly list off the factors that a sniper's taking into consideration when making the shots. So things like wind adjustments. Yeah, so you got to think of the wind. You got to think the biometric pressure. So if you know the pressure around you. So if you think of a fish tank full of water, and you get a and you get like a coat hanger and you scrape your, your coat hanger through it, the water's going to part. You imagine that water's air. That's that's you've that's what you've got to um, fight against with that bullet as well. So biometric pressure, the altitude, higher you go, thin the air is going to be. Heat as well because you've got heat shimmer. You've got four types of heat shimmer. Uh, the cold as well because the uh, the density of the air is more thicker. Um, it's over a thousand yards, wherever you place in the world, you've got to think of the Coriolis effect of the world going around, that would affect your bullet over a thousand yards. You know, there's there's loads you've got to think of before taking that shot, you know. Elevation? Your, your Elevation, yeah, to where you are. Um, to, to where you are, obviously the air's going to be thinner, the higher you go. So, yeah. Good, 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 good. And let's talk equipment now, because obviously everyone pitches a sniper rifle, don't they? But we can take that one further. You've got your spotter with his scope. Yep. So you have um, the equipment that one sniper carries would be sidearm pistol, uh, would be an SAAT rifle, would be his AW sniper rifle with um, his his scope, uh, as well as a spare scope as well, well as a, a night scope, night optics. Uh, you'll carry a spare spotting scope as well. Um, ammunition for your sidearm, um, probably 100 rounds. You carry 100 rounds of SE80 rounds, magazine full, and you'll probably carry about 50 rounds of um, uh, AW sniper rifle rounds. You've got to carry your water, uh, as well as radio, spare batteries, um, spare optics, binoculars, you know, food, you got to contain your rations as well, as well as your shit. you got to take your shit and piss with you wherever you go. You know, the idea is to leave no sign on that ground. A ghillie suit, take your ghillie with you. And roughly you ask about it as, oh, yeah, and a GPS, laser binos. And that's about it as you carry equipment-wise for a sniper on the ground, yeah. And that's just one person, so your number two will carry them out as well. Oh, that's a lot, isn't it? And my limited understanding is that the spotting scope is 
obviously way more powerful than the sniper scope. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, it'd be like 40 times more powerful and it'll have the same grapple call in there as your sniper rifle. So wherever the spotting scope would do, and you'd go, yeah, it's three mil dots left. You put three mil dots left on your sniper scope and you can spot, you know, where that target is. Yeah, got you, got you. And can you tell us about what currently, what, what rifle does the British Army issue for Yeah, they, they, they carry the L1185 um, A3 uh, sniper rifle, which is an AW, which stands for Arctic Warfare, because it was mainly uh, done for the Marines to start off with. And then they, the British Army took over that rifle from the uh, L95, which is the very first sniper rifle um, that came into service, you know, made by Dave Walls from Macquarie International. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I fired that. I think I fired that one. They used to well, pull this... Um, the L96. Yeah. The- Fantastic rifle in the green zone. That's what I, I did my first tour with that. Mm-hmm. You know, really good rifle in the green zone. It was light, you know, and when you shot the bullet, it laid quite flat over 300 yards. So you can engage targets standing up, you know, if you didn't have time to... Um, get your side arm out or your rifle out. When you say green zone, is that your sort of urban area? Uh, in Afghan itself, uh, you have a green belt going through it, uh, especially the northern um, Helmand province. Mm. And we call it the green zone. Basically, it's like, I'm not sure, I think if it's a mile either side and it's just like tropical and it's all uh, watery and stuff like that. And uh, we call that the green zone, uh, you know, and then more you spread out, more it becomes more desert. And Yeah, got you, got you. Yeah, we, our training team had got, we were down at the ranges and they'd um, booked out of the armory a sniper rifle. And they used to do this sneak, sneaky trick. It's really awful. Um, but you didn't really think twice about it back then. They used to, they, they didn't tell people to keep the scope away from your eye. Oh, eye relief, yeah. Yeah, and of course the SA-80 that we were trained, uh, or what I was initially trained on, has a rubber, you know, rubber eye pad around it, so it doesn't really matter if it knocks back in, and and it's only 5.56, so there's no real sort of kickback of substance. But of course, somebody trained on that will then pick up the sniper rifle, put it right into their eye. Yeah. And the yeah. kickback is it's like like a horse kicking back and and it puts a semicircular cut right down to the bone. Um yeah, I saw mm. that happen. We call it a sniper rash. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, gosh. And um what's what what are you doing to set yourself up for the shot then? Is is it is it similar to when you're in a firefight in the military that you don't oil your you don't oil your barrels so you don't get a puff of smoke come out of it? Uh, what, what I used to do is um, carry my rifle with a pull through on it, and um, as soon as I'm back to fire, I'll pull the pull through through. So I would clean the barrel anyway, so it's dry anyway. But because of the desert and the sand and God knows what. Yeah, I'll just pull it through quickly and I've got I've got enough time to get on the ground anyway because the tick's happening. So it's not going anywhere. And then you get in, then you need to be PID the target. And that's why a sniper is more deadly on the ground because you can PID that target better than anyone in the contact because they've got like a SUSAT site or an ACOG and they they haven't got um they know where the firing's coming from but they're, they're putting covering fire down. But because you've got that, you know, times five, times 25, times 56 scope, you know, you could look at it like I'm looking at you now, you know, so you can PID that target properly and and then you can take that target out. And which was your first theatre of war that you operated as a sniper in? Uh, it was a rack, yeah, yeah. That would have been quite a while ago now then. Yeah. Yeah, it was quite, quite, um, yeah, it was my first, my first kill was the, 
you know, was we were in a mog in the desert, in the Maysan desert, and we just kept getting hammered all the time by mortars and artillery, you know, and we found out that we were getting scouted by a guy on a motorbike and he kept calling the artillery in, so, or the mortars in. So my job was to take that guy out, and which I did, it was 675 yards away, you know, but I had to take the heat shiver. If you ever see in the movies, when you see somebody walking towards you, they always look taller, you know, and so I had to shoot quite high on that one. Yeah, and I, I hit him about there in the, in the throat. Had you had you killed anyone before that in your other in your other um, active service? No, mm. no, not at all. How does that affect? How does that affect you? Like I always say to people, you you feel in trouble. You know, you feel like you're going to get tapped on the shoulder and somebody's going to take you away and go and you just killed someone. Mm. You know, but um, the taps on the shoulder, I was getting, I was saying, well done. You know, thanks. You know, you save lives because it was only a matter of time before them mortars were on target, and we started taking casualties. So that guy needed taken out, and um, yeah, and that's what I'd done. And he had a lot of intel on him as well. You know, I remember going up to the body. He had maps on him, and he had a radio that was tuned into the icon chatter. You, you know, and um, he was clearly insurgent. Yes. Well, it's kill or be killed, isn't it? Exactly. You play the game, you're going to get burnt. Yeah, yeah. Gosh. Um, how, how did the, the longest shot come around? We were on a... I was in position a uh, day before the op, and it was my job to um, give overwatch for a um, patrol going in, a mixture of uh, British soldiers and the Afghan army. Now the British soldiers were in that Afghan army patrol because they were teaching them how to patrol, you know, and uh, to search and um, to soldier better. And I think it was Yorks were, the Yorkshire regiments were in the, um, in the patrol of the Afghan army, the ANA. And they were approaching this village and the village, I could see the Taliban were um, queuing up an attack, but I could engage the targets then because I had to make sure that it wasn't, you know, they they weren't, they were going to engage that patrol. I had to make sure that. So, and um, it was about eleven o'clock in the in the morning. It was a perfect day, winter tour, you know, and. I had an interpreter with me and he was tuned into the icon chatter and somebody was working them, these Taliban. Somebody was um, telling them what to do and where to go and I couldn't work it out where it was and I saw a glint in the far distance and it was an antenna and it was a guy on a radio. So um, I stood against a, a wall. That's what my, not many people understand. I was stood up when I'd done my shot. I leant against a compound wall and I bracketed, and what bracketing is, I took my first shot, and where it, where I saw it strike, I just added more elevation on all the time uh, until I hit the compound wall. And when I hit the compound wall, and then the icon chatter went quiet, and then the only voice we heard was the guy saying, I can't direct you anymore, I'm getting shot at from somewhere, and that person was from me. So I, my intentions were to keep his head down. Well, anyway, the patrol went in and they got engaged by the Taliban and I was engaging targets um, that day and it went on to about two o'clock in the afternoon. It was horrendous. So I made it, I was in charge of the snipers on the ground and I made a command decision to move three vehicles that I had behind me into the kill zone to block the, um, the attack and to block the patrol trying to make the extraction, trying to get all the wounded out. So I made that decision and my guys were engaging targets. And then suddenly all the lads went and hit the ground. They were getting engaged by somewhere by an automatic weapon. And I could hear, tuk, 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 tuk. I couldn't work it out where it was coming from. So I checked all my firing points. Everywhere I engaged a target, I checked where it was coming from. I couldn't find anything. So I looked up, 
the only place I didn't check is where I shot 11 o'clock in the morning was at that compound wall. So I checked and there was two guys there and they were on a PKM uh, belt fed machine gun and they were spraying down onto my lads. So I fired the first shot. Um, I missed. I fired my second shot. And as the guy stood up, um, I hit him in the chest. He fell down. And then I um, fired a third shot. And as I fired my third shot, I moved across and fired a fourth shot. So I had two bullets in the air at the same time. The third one missed and the fourth one hit the guy in the side, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And the only reason why we knew why I hit him is because you try and get that weapon you try and get that weapon so it doesn't recycle back into the insurgent's hands, but the weapon were already gone, but the dead were there, and that's why I knew I was shot. And it, it took six seconds flight for that bullet to hit the target, and it, we worked it out. It slowed down from... There's three flights to a bullet. There's supersonic, so as soon as it leaves the barrel, it's breaking the sound barrier, supersonic, and then it goes transonic when it starts wobbling, And then it goes subsonic, where the bullet slows down so much, it, it you know, until it hits the target. And it, we worked it out that it slowed down to about 40 miles an hour. So if you were driving a car, you would see the bullet, you know, flying through the air. And that's, um, and that's how the shot, I, I never knew I broke the world record then. An Apache helicopter came up because we were in a, a contact for a hell of a long time. And they came up, and obviously they work in pairs, So one popped up and another popped up over the ridge line and they GPSed it at 2,475 yards or something, something like that. How is it? I mean, I would imagine it becomes quite addictive. You know, you take one guy out and then another one appear, almost video game-ish. Yeah, you become, you become numb. You become numb to it. Uh, because um, you you have to just box it in your head, you know. So you do it. You do one kill. You 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 was it decompartmentalize compromise or something? Like compartmentalize it. That's it. That's the word. Yeah. yeah you sort of just have to store it in your head all the time because you're doing the job. You're doing the job, and what you're doing is saving lives. You know, and that's important. Yeah. But yeah, you just try and ignore it and just get on with the job. Acting like they're targets, not human beings. That's a good one. You know, the hard, I think the hardest thing is is when you make stories up. So you get into a location and you have to observe them. You're there for a week and you sort of get to know that person and um, you get to know his routine, you get to know his family, you get to know he's got kids You get to know you've got chickens, cows, goats, and stuff like that. And then you get the green light to take that target out because he turns out to be an insurgent. And that, that's hard. That's hard. Did it put you in a situation where you were getting a, a lot more kills than the rest of your troop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, um, there was only two snipers in my troop. Um, so the rest were just uh, lads on the ground. And we just, we had jackal um, open top um, vehicles. So we just scoot around the location. And if there was a long distance shot or would give overwatch and they needed more protection, that's when I used to get my sniper rifle out and give pop protection. Like I said before, I could PID the, P the targets better than anyone else. So it does help. And what was the response from your lads to your successes, um, I'm guessing it probably wasn't always positive. Um, my lads worked really hard and we became quite a close, close group of people. And we were in high demand in Afghan, you know. Um, we were just getting dark. It's called fracturize the flat. So fracturize the forward line of enemy troops. So basically they draw a circle on a map and we have to break that circle to find out where the Taliban are. So you'll go north until you get engaged. 
you go south until you get engaged, you go east, you go west, and then they put a dot and they draw a bigger circle. So this is how far the Taliban are and they take, and that's when they hand over to the next tour, they say, this is how far we push the Taliban back, you know, and it's called factualizing the flex, you're factualizing that, that circle. So, yeah, it's quite hard, especially getting hit and being in the contact all the time, you know, and we were in such a demand that we didn't get much downtime either. So it's quite hard. So well, the guess- lads, we, we were the same calibre, you know, there was no animosity because I was getting kills and the lads weren't. There was no animosity at all. It was just we're there to do a job and the lads knew it as well. can be a lot of sort of testosterone fuel rivalry in the... Yeah, it was if it's my... my that tour, that side of tour, there was only three guys that had been on tour before. The rest, it was their first tour, and there were 16 of us. You know, it was all first tour. So they were apprehensive as well, you know, especially it became, I knew the Marines did it as well. The, the Marines were taking casualties because they were too scared to fire back because of the repercussions of killing someone. Mm. You know, why did you kill that person? You know, so. You know, I've, I've ran down the line before shouting, why aren't we fucking returning fire? Why aren't we returning fire? Because people were scared of the repercussions of being engaged by the enemy and shooting back. But as a sniper, you know, I had, I had confidence in myself that I could get the job done, you know. Mm. And the long shot, Craig, was this in Iraq or Afghanistan? Afghanistan, yeah. Mm. Afghan, yeah. I, 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 like I said, I didn't even know. I didn't even know until I got back to England and it all got leaked out. So, And what was the response like from the, the public side of things and also the military? The military let me down massively. You know, they, they've um, never censored the story that went out when, when Metal Metals prayed and then we started getting death threats and um, my wife was getting death threats, my daughter and myself and the regiment didn't do anything anything at all you know and I felt very let down by them as well you know and I broke the world record for the longest sniper kill my rifle only goes 1500 yards you know it's been broke now by a 50 cal but I still hold it for that small calibre mm-hmm. but the regiment didn't I didn't do it I did it because I needed to do it because I was saving lives. I didn't do it because it was a, you know, I broke the world record, ha uh, you know, but the regiment gave me no credit for it at all. No, they let me down massively. Mm. Did you take a lot of shit from, I think I mentioned this earlier, you, you've only got to start talking about sniping in it. Everyone's done it. Everyone's done it. You meet someone in the army, you go, yeah, I was a sniper. You yeah. know, and so you start yeah. talking to them, you're going, fucking, you're just a Walter Mitty, mate. You know, you haven't experienced it, you know. But I've, I, I went there, I've done it, uh, and I've done a job of a sniper, of observation of the battlefield, and I've also taken targets out as well. So I've lived the sniper role, you know. But, yeah, I know you get a lot of animosity because you are a sniper. You know, I've had... Not as much now, but when it all got leaked out that I was a murderer, I was a killer, I was a trained assassin, you know, you're thinking, fucking hell, mate, I was just doing my job. How can you shoot someone? I tell you what, you'd be in my fucking situation where you're getting shot at, where you see your mate lying there being shot and you not shoot back. I'll give you a gun and you're telling me you won't shoot back, Mm. you know? They're, They're the couch potatoes that just want to speak. Keyboard warriors. Yeah, it's Call of Duty generation, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Our friends at home, I don't mean everybody that plays Call of Duty, but I'm saying it does does bring out this kind of phenomenon. Um, yeah. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And what what made you leave the art? The, because you... Uh, PTSD. Yeah. PTSD. I, I, I would have I stayed, stayed on, Chris. I would have stayed on, mate, but... Uh, my wife noticed it first, you know, the, the telltale signs. I thought I was fine, you know, especially going on exercise after tour. I didn't, I didn't feel right, but every time, like, you know, when you, the other squadrons play enemy, I was taking it too far. I was 
in my head, I'm still in fucking Afghan here. I'm still in Iraq. You know, when I got blown up in Afghan on my last tour, all my emotions, like an ice wall, got shattered. So everything that I was putting in boxes just got blown apart and it just flooded. And I just couldn't control it. But I thought I was in control. But obviously I wasn't because my wife noticed it first and then the army noticed it. And after doing 23 years, it took me half an hour to get kicked out. You know, not even a thank you. Can you give us an idea so we can kind of build up the mental health picture? How how did it start manifesting? Um, like being on my own. Um, thought everyone was against me. Thought I was getting followed. Paranoia. Um, arguing with my wife for no reason at all, even though she's the best support in the world. And I just picked an argument with her for a simple thing, you know, uh, can't, the way she eats and s- silly things. Um, going off sex life, going off it, you know, and suicidal thoughts. And you think, what the fuck's going on here? You feel out, you feel out of control. You feel totally, totally out of control and you can't control it. Whatever goes into your head, you just think, I just can't control this. And you want it to stop. And I can see why people do commit suicide because sometimes I thought in my head, it's the only way out. It's the only way I can stop this in my head, you know? Mm. Were you drinking at all? Do you know what? My therapist that I see, he says, it surprises me, Craig. And I said, why? He goes, because you don't take drugs. Does your medication? He goes, we don't take drugs. You don't drink. And I said, because I'm stronger. I'm, I'm a strong person, mm. you know, and I know I've got complex PTSD and I've got depression, but I refuse to be in that line where I'm going to let a drug or alcohol control my life, mm. you know. So I go to the gym at four in the morning. I try and control it in other ways. And my dog helps me, you know, she's 18 this year, you know, and she's still going on. She keeps me going. And the most person that keeps me on this planet is my wife. Mm. The, the one that keeps me on the straight and narrow, my wife. The one that stops me taking drugs and going alcohol, my wife. And she's a, an incredible person. Big shout out to your wife. Yeah. Have you got to the bottom of what's behind PTSD? Because it's, it's called complex PTSD for a reason. As no. in, there's a multitude of yeah, factors it's... that combine. No, not at all. Not at all. No. I don't think. Like we discussed before, I am a slave to medication. Mm. Slave to it. And I'm too scared to come off it because I have come off it before and I've, I've crashed. I've crashed massively. And Tanya's going, why are you like this? I thought, yeah, everything's fine. And I tell her, I've come off my meds. And she goes, go back on them. As soon as I'm on them, I'm a different person again. Mm. You know? Yeah, we can discuss this late, later, mate. It's um, worth getting to the bottom of it all, though, because um, we only get one life, don't we? And Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, can't stay on the, that toxic meds for too well. No. You've got to stay on meds as long as that they do the job that they're for and yeah. Very often these sort of meds, they're to get people over a challenging period in their life. And then we've got to start um, uh, lots of things, changing our life, changing our thinking and, and, um, and uh, adopting a, a less um, damaging way of dealing with trauma. But you'll you'll get there, mate. You won't. You, you certainly won't be the first, and definitely yeah. won't won't be the last. And yeah, for sure. Clearly, from what the story you've told us, you've you've you've, you've definitely you've definitely got it in your uh, character to get on top of this one. It can just seem hard at the time. I, I know what it's like. I remember um, after I left the mob, I was having a particularly bad time at, at, at one time, and I. And I phoned up the um, sick bay in the, in the naval base near us. And I just said, look, please, I'm an ex-Marine. Can I just come see 
come and see the doc. He's like, you know, you just want to be back in that environment where you can talk straight with people when they yeah. get you. And, 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 and um, I can remember that the, the Wren that I spoke to who answered the call or whatever rank she was or role she was, um, she thought she was covering up the phone, but she couldn't. I could still hear her. And she was just like sniggering at the dock. You know, you know, we've got this guy. He's not, he's not even in the mob anymore, but he wants to. And it, it's hard, you know, it's hard. You, you, you've, you've given so many year, years of your life to something that, that is all consuming and you, it becomes your identity. And then at the click of a thing, you suddenly realize, oh no, actually I was just a number on a bit of paper at Whitehall. Yeah, exactly what you are. The beauty of it is it works both ways. It's once you learn to embrace that that's all you were, then you 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 can move on into actually really fulfilling your your potential. Um yes. How's um how's the old public speaking going? What sort what sort of stuff do people want to hear and um, basically basically about um about my life really, about how I'm coping with mental health and how I cope and how I overcome things, you know, and they, they like to know about the shot as well. How did the shot come around? Things like that. They're interested, but um, more, more of like, yeah, I, 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 I can get through this. I'm experiencing it and I'm still going through it and I'm still here. And it's, it's like my Instagram, you know, and me and my wife answer all the questions all the time, every single one, everyone that replies to us, we always reply back to them, you know, to give them encouragement. And the amount of people that turned back to me and said, fucking hell, I just thought you wouldn't speak to me. I just thought I'd send you a message just hoping you would speak. And you go, no, mate, you know, uh, if you want to talk, we'll talk, you know. And people have spoke to me at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, and I've been there for them, you know, and that's, that's where it all ends, you know, just giving people hope and strength. Mm-hmm. Mate, you've got a whole lifetime of that ahead of you because you, yeah. you've got one hell of a story and um, you've certainly got the skill set and you've got the, the, you know, the passion for help, helping people. Um, oh, massively. I've, just, I've, I've, I've opened a survival school, uh, Maverick Survival, and um, I aim to, well, the people I get on here, civilians with mental health issues, or just normal civilians. It doesn't have to be anyone with issues. You can, they can come along. But, you know, and with um, Cloud Orca, a company that sponsored me, uh, they um, they pay for three, three spaces each month for military veterans with mental health issues to come down to the school so they can uh, experience just a bit of survival skills you know, just to get out and about into the wilderness once more, find that connection, you know, find a bit of purpose in their life. Is this survival as in sort of bushcraft type stuff? Yeah, but all bushcraft stuff. So it's making fires, whittling, eating out, of, you know, sausages on the old campfire sort of stuff, you know, and I provide everything for them. So if you haven't got any gear, you just tip up and warm clothing, medication if you're taking it, a wash kit. I provide the tents for you, the sleeping bags if you need it. You know, so people aren't under that stress. They have to buy everything. They just come along. Brilliant. You'll have to yeah. send us all the links for all of this, Craig. Yeah, we'll, we'll do. We'll do, yeah. Put them below the video. And uh, the great thing about bushcraft is it's the ultimate in mindfulness. No, oh, without, without a doubt, you know. And the amount of people that tip up and we sit there, because I only take um, threes and twos because I feel that they're getting my full attention then. I'm not taking 10 people where I'm I'm talking to John here and there's Bob over there doing sort of mental with an axe. You know, I'm just, I'm, you know, I've got, you've got, they got my full attention and that's what they like. And they say the time just goes like that. You know, it's one minute, it's nine o'clock. And next minute they look at the watch, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Brilliant. Craig, listen, it's been absolutely legendary talking to you. I could go on and on, but I'm trying to keep my podcast shorter these days. No so um, I'd rather have 
loads of people go, oh, look, this is an hour I've, I can listen to an hour. Then we go on for three hours and they go, oh, I can't, I ain't got time for that. And I want, I want everybody to hear your, your, your story. So massive, massive thank you. Um, any way I can help you, just, just, you know, or support you or whatever to do anything. We're always welcome back on the show. Um, then uh, you just say the word, mate, yeah? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show. And, oh, my uh, like pleasure. Like I said, I could talk on, I could talk as well. So, <laughs> well, then we'll we'll do another show, mate. That's that's fine. Friends at home, if you've got a load of questions, put them below and and say, Chris, can you get Craig back on? And then, oh, oh, and Luke and I will get it get it sorted. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so give my best wishes to your your good woman. I will do. Tell her to keep doing what she's doing, and. To everybody at home, massive thank you for tuning in to uh, another episode. Big love to you all. Please look after yourself. Um, we'll see you next time.